So good morning, Arthur. Um, I've been listening to your TED Talk, and one of the most amazing things from it is how you marry this commitment to capitalism with a lifelong concern for the poor. And <laughs> I'd just love for you just to unpack where that's come from and how you marry those two things together. Thanks, Philippa, and thanks for your commitment to these ideas. So I, thanks for your commitment to ideas and lifting people up um, from all different political perspectives. And, you know, that's... That's the basis of my, my thinking about the economy uh, and the purpose of the economy, including the economic systems that we adhere to in the UK and the United States, fundamentally capitalistic. The question for me is, what's the purpose of any economic system? And the answer is, the right answer in my view, the right moral answer in my view, is never to make rich people richer. Yeah. I, I think that one of the great uh, privileges that we've had is to, to live in a time to live in an economic system in which we can push prosperity out to the margins of our society, something to which I've been really firmly committed. I had kind do you of, believe that can happen? I do, and I believe it is. Yeah. I believe that fundamentally has in ways that, that most people don't really realize. Yeah. And <clears throat> the epiphany for me about this came when I, when I, when I realized, I, I, I came very late to studying economics and, and social science. I was, a, I was a professional classical musician for many years. And in my late 20s, I went to college and I studied economics for the first time. And I learned something that, oh, wow, just the scales fell, fell from my eyes, that the world had gone from being almost uniformly poor to one that mostly wasn't. And is that what's made you more optimistic? Because you are like remarkably optimistic. You know, it's funny. So there are days when I'm optimistic, but I'm always hopeful. Yeah, okay. And, and hope is to say that, that something can be done and we can do something about it. Yeah. Optimism says that everything's gonna turn out okay, and, and it might or might not in, in different places and at different times. But the reason I'm really hopeful, notwithstanding my, my relative optimism, is that I have seen that in our hands are the tools for the very first time in human history to make life better for not everybody, but almost everybody. And, and the reason I believe that is because I've seen the evidence for it. I mean, this was this great sort of awakening for me in my late 20s, intellectual awakening yeah. for me in my late 20s, was when I saw that, that since I was a kid, for example, in 1970, 80% of starvation level poverty had been eradicated around the world. Most people are not aware of this. Yeah, most people don't understand that. And no. how, how, what's been driving that? So that's the interesting thing yeah. for me. I went on a, on a vision quest to find out what it is mm. that was doing that. Why? Because if you don't understand it, then it, you leave it up to serendipity whether it'll yeah. happen again. What I'm saying is that two billion of our brothers and sisters have been pulled out of poverty since I was a child. And either it was an accident or a, you know just chance or or maybe something happened that we can understand and, and, and replicate. So that's the the the, the the quest I was on was actually figure out specifically what did that. And in studying economics, to be able to understand the answer to that question, I, I was trying to get beyond you know, political considerations and basic ideology. And I found that there were basically five forces that had emerged in world economies, particularly starting from the West, yeah. that had pulled two billion people out of poverty. And they were globalization, yeah. free trade, yeah. property rights, yeah. the rule of law, and the culture of entrepreneurship. And all of these other sources of freedom had flowed from these things. Now, this is not a panacea because there are also things that we need, proper controls and regulation and, 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 and basic human morality, of course. And you talk about this two billion lifted out of poverty. So where has that happened? And uh, can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, sure. So that's happened, the answer, the short answer is every place. Yeah. <clears throat> but primarily in, in places like China and India that have the largest populations and that have growing middle classes. But the opening up of societies uh, after about 1980 in China and after about 1990 in India, that, that in, in China's more problematic because it's still somewhat planned economy and, and it certainly does not have democratic freedoms. But in India that moved beyond Nehruvian socialism um, and started to open up an entrepreneurial class that, that lifted up all parts of yeah. society. And, and so the result of that is in those countries that you go to, which have the bulk of the population, you see a different world than you yeah. used to see. I mean, I, I started traveling in India when I was a teenager. And <clears throat> it's a completely different country. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a different world. You know, there, you don't see the street level poverty that you once saw. Even in slums in India, you see an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you see the ability to provide public goods that once would have been utterly unthinkable. And furthermore, you see an optimism yes. that you wouldn't have seen there before. And I honestly believe 
that except for failed states and war and tyranny, 35 years from now, we will have no uniformly poor countries yeah. in the world. So, Arthur, you talk about free markets and this optimism that you have. So why, if they can be that effective in changing the life trajectory of some of our poorest, um, are we beginning to turn against them in our kind of political narrative? <laughs> it's interesting. The, the, it, what is the, the, the great fiction about capitalism, yeah. and by that I, I don't mean just you know, laissez-faire, anarcho-capitalist, you know, Ayn Rand. I'm talking about democratic capitalism. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the free enterprise system that has proper controls and a, a robust role for government. And one of the things that you find is that the great fiction about the free enterprise system is, is great for rich people and bad for poor yeah. people. The truth of the matter is it is great for poor people and a little dangerous for rich people. Can you talk <clears throat> us through that? Well, part of it is that, that materialism is a tyranny. Yeah. Greed is a tyranny. And in our societies, we find that, that robust material well-being mm. doesn't get us all the things that we need. Yeah. And, and so the promise of what democratic capitalism seems to offer on its face is unsatisfying to a lot of people. And furthermore, it doesn't guarantee that everybody's going to have equal opportunities. So, so that, in, you know, in the United States or here in the UK, there's, there's very little third world kind of poverty. Yeah. In the United States, we don't have, except for public health problems, we don't have the kind of hunger that you would see in, in, in Asia and Africa. But when certain people are prospering at a different rate than other people are prospering, that relative difference, set of differences, creates resentments. And, and what that means is that we don't just need more unbridled growth. We need more than that. And when, when people find unsatisfying the promises of unbridled growth, it creates a kind of a cancer in our developed societies. It creates envy. It creates a, a dissatisfaction. You know, the, the Buddhists, they always say that the first noble truth is that life is dissatisfaction or suffering. And you, know, you live with that. So these, these material attachments, they become a tyranny. And the result of that is that with the, with the in inequality of the economic growth that we see, notwithstanding the fact that people aren't generally starving, yeah that some people are doing better than others. So I can see the, how that works in India, and I can see some of the impact of that in China. But obviously one of the big challenges for your country is areas like the Rust Belt um, in the US. Right. How, yeah. how can free markets begin to really work for that community? So the biggest problem that we have in developed societies, yeah. uh, where people are turning against capitalism, yeah. not turning against capitalism, but they're turning against this faith yeah. in the free enterprise system to lift people up <clears throat> is the belief that it leaves too many people behind. Yeah. And, and by that, it doesn't mean that people are starving to death, but they're not Thriving. needed. Yeah. They're not needed by their society because this is the key thing. The, 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 the basis of our sense of dignity, we believe that we have radically equal dignity. Mm -hmm. That's what virtually everybody in modern societies believe that. But we all know we don't have an equal sense of our dignity. Yeah. Dignity comes from feeling necessary to society, feeling needed by families and by communities and, and indeed by the economy. Yeah. And when we have in these big societies where we can afford to have a lot of people who are supported through the welfare state, for example, those people will not be starving, but they won't have a sense of dignity. And, and I'm telling you, I mean, people will fight back if they're starving. They'll really fight back if they don't have a sense of their dignity. Yeah. And that's what we're doing wrong. That's not, a, that's not a fault of capitalism. It's a lack of imagination. It's a lack of mercy. And it's a lack of being warriors for equal human dignity. And that's what we're doing wrong. And the result is going to be... Number one, misery that's avoidable. Yeah. But number two, we're going to lose the basis of the systems that have lifted us all up. And in, in fact, we need to get the next two billion people out of poverty at the periphery of our, our society in the world. Absolutely. Now, in the UK, um, poverty, ironically, has become one of the most hardly fought over issues between left and, and right. And um, why do you think that is? And where do you think we need one another, uh, the left and the right, to really find the right solutions? We have the same situation in the United yeah. States. And it's a largely unproductive conversation yeah. in the United States. And part of it has to do with the fact that, uh, that poverty in, in developed societies 
um, is again very relative. Mm. There's extremely little starvation, and that's an incredible achievement. It's the dignity issue, the dignity gap mm. that we talk about. And one of the things that's extremely unproductive in the left right debate about poverty today is that the one thing they can kind of agree on is that work is a punishment. And so you see people on the political left in the United States and the UK talking about not wanting to punish poor people by forcing them to work. Yeah. And on the right, talking about making people work for their benefits, which is a form of punishment. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's weird. I mean, they, they have and different... Work is such an important... Yeah, and work is not a punishment. No. Work is a blessing. Yeah. And the idea of supporting yourself and your family and, yeah. and, and working for what you have, this is what the sense of dignity relies yeah. on. And so that's why it's an incredibly unproductive debate. Now that said, I think there's a lot of ways to think about this. We should be able to come to terms around the idea that, that work is a good thing and should pay, and we should have a right-left debate about how to make work pay. Yeah. You know, the left prefers minimum wages, and the right prefers uh, the structure of work programs and in which we can have perhaps wage subsidies that work in a way that doesn't distort wages. All of that is sort of wonkishness at the margins. But if we can agree that work is good, work is a blessing, work is, I mean, people are created vocationally, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful generative yeah. thing to be able to work is really, really important. Now, on the other hand, one of the things that I, I admire about the left and, and right is that they bring unique kind of charisms to the debate. They, they bring unique a sense of, of you know, what's important in the society such that everybody can thrive. The right is very good about talking about the freedom of all individuals and the belief that everybody can earn their success. Yeah. The left brings a, a very healthy just concern for the people who've yeah. been left behind. We should be able to marry that up because those are not antagonistic ideas. In yeah. your own work, Philippa, yeah. you've shown yeah, that this absolutely. belief in earned success and a belief that we can that we we empower ourselves, yeah. we become fully human when we when we fight for the people at the periphery of society yeah. because they are us. Yeah. They are us in a different state. I mean, that's the hybrid of right and, and left. I love it when the left and right come together. Because actually that's when you get some of the most powerful solutions as well. You can, for sure. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I think that we miss yeah. when just in right-left solutions is we tend to think yeah. that, that the solution to poverty problems, economic growth problems, that they're all policy. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things that, you know, when right and left, they come together, they work at the 5% margin of life. Yeah. When I was... When I was finishing my, my, I did a PhD in public policy. When I was finished, after really hard fought, really took a lot of work. When I was finishing, and my great mentor was a guy named James Q. Wilson, who was the, probably the most influential social scientist of the past 50 years in the United States. And he was set on my dissertation defense, which went very poorly. <laughs> and he, uh, he said something like this. You know, I'm trying to recreate it. He's, he passed away in 20, 2012. But I remember this conversation where he said, well, now i got to tell you kind of the the dirty secret about public policy. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, it's never more than about the 5% margin of life. Mm. And I said, huh, you could have told me that before I started my PhD. <laughs> and then I said, so what's the other 95%? And he said, mostly love. Yeah. And I don't think government should ever be in the business of love. But I think that we as it's people who are working in the like you and I, mm. we, we, we run think tanks and, and we're academics or we, we work in government. Remembering that the, the nuclear fuel rods of yeah. human life are not policies and yeah. welfare programs and subsidies it's and people. and government offices. It's it's the, the love that people have and the relationships that yeah. people have for each other. Yeah. And, and that's where we should be spending a lot of our time too. Yeah. You know, what do we do? And okay, so what do we do? We get out of the way of those relationships. Yeah. We create we don't create disincentives for people to practice their faith, for people to form their families, to form coherent communities, mm -hmm. and especially for people to work and earn their success. Yeah. So that's an important thing for us to remember, yeah. I believe. Well, that may well, in fact, take me on to my final question, Arthur, which is, you know, we've talked about free markets and globalization and entrepreneurship and, and the value of, of work. Um, but uh, that can often feel kind of very distant and on a macro level. Mm. But taking it down onto my community mm. or the person standing in front of me. And um, uh, do we do when you are looking at your at your work? Do you feel that it has the solutions to the person standing in front of me or the poverty in my own community? You know, in my worst days, I feel like it's too distant. 
And, and, and part of the reason is because it's easy to be abstract when you're dealing at the national level. I work in Washington, D.C. We're sitting yeah. here having this conversation in London. You know, these are, these are the world yeah. capitals, and, and, we're at the, and, and you know, you're, you're in the government, yeah. and, and you're running a think tank. Mm -hmm. um, so the key thing that I like to keep in mind, basically, such that we can ground our work in the everyday experience of people, is to take the, take the, uh, the, the advice of Pope Francis. Yeah. When he was in Washington, D.C. in 2013, he was giving a, a homily to all of the American bishops. And in his homily, he said, don't forget that the shepherds need to smell like the sheep. Mm -hmm. I thought, huh, that's great advice, you know, because as a Catholic, you know, one of the real problems is the bishops are really far away. They're very bureaucratic sometimes, and it's easy for them to, to make decisions that don't actually, because I'm a, I'm a Catholic sheep, yeah. right? I want the shepherds to smell like me, right? But then I thought about it a little bit more, and I thought, you know, Pope Francis is talking to me too. You know, in my work, I'm a bishop. You know, I get to run a big think tank. I work in Washington, D.C. I work with the, the leaders in Congress. It's the equivalent of what you're doing here in London. And then I thought, I wonder if I smell sheepy enough. <laughs> um, and so the result is that, that I changed my work, actually. I started to, to remember that if I'm going to do this relatively abstract policy work, I also need to talk to the people that yeah. it affects. Yeah. So the, the beginning to answer the question appropriately that you just asked is not to say, okay, can I give advice to the guy standing next to me who's poor? Mm. The right question is not that because then, then you're doing a different kind of work. Yeah. However, your ideas are meaningless unless you actually know the people that you're talking about. Yeah. And it will change your fundamental approach and yeah. it has changed the fundamental approach of mine as well. Go know the people that you're actually talking about and don't talk about them, but rather understand the question of being one of us. Yeah. Arthur Books, president of the AEI, absolutely lovely to speak to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philippa.